Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Show Up with Cameron Gran. I'm Cameron Gran, your friend, just going along his own mental health journey, trying to help guide you with some tools and tricks I've learned. And today I'm joined by Aaron Kennedy from Comedy Sport. Hello. Well, I just saw something on Instagram that you were just promoted to be like the associate director of Comedy Sports. So. I am officially the association director of Comedy Sports Worldwide. What's the difference between the Twin Cities version and Worldwide? Like, there is, is there no of- different. It's our mother. It's like our mothership is comedy sports worldwide. It's a licensing thing where cities and theater companies can buy into become a shareholder of the thing that then we get perform in different cities. So it's in about 30 cities nationwide and then also in Manchester, UK. We're all such a big family. It's so great. We learn so much from each of the cities, too, that we have these interactions with. We all come together at least once a year for something called the the Comedy Sports World Championship where we have cities going against cities and I've represented before in San Jose and in LA and in Philadelphia just to to get everyone together we do workshops and then we just have all of these public shows where it's city versus city and we kind of just take over whatever city we are in and it's great and then I wanted to ask more about your personal journey about how like you got started in improv Oh, yeah. So so here's the deal. Relationships are funny, right? <laughs> kind of in the ways that a lot of them help you in ways that you least expect it to. And the longest relationship I had ever been in in my life, we had gone out to go see comedy sports. This was, I want to say, before 2010. And we go to comedy sports and I'm like, I could do that. No, I can't. No, you can't. Shut, shut your mouth, Kennedy. Don't do that. Stop it. You cannot. And then they had mentioned something about classes. Lo and behold, the best birthday gift I ever got, no, Christmas gift that I got was a level one comedy sports improv class. And then I was hooked. It was like I was in this class of all of the weird misfit toys on Misfit Island. The weirdos who we always tried to morph into somebody else to fit in with a particular group. You know, the ones who felt like in order to be this thing in life, I have to look and act a certain way. I have to be this size. I have to, you know, weigh this much in order to be successful. And then I found this weird group of wackadoos. It was like the permission was given for me to just let me out instead of create whatever character and costume I was trying to be in real life. Isn't that weird? Like something that has to do with acting taught me how to be myself. I definitely understand that because I don't have a comedy improv background, but I I got started in acting in horror improv. Yes! Yeah. And so I definitely learned a lot about myself through that. The commitment thing is like the most I ever scared somebody is when I finally let go of being like, I don't want to scare somebody that's me. And I was like, no, I'm going to scare you. I want to win those no, awards. No, this is literally scary. my job right now. My literal job is to scare someone. And somebody saw something in me that was like, oh, I bet you could scare somebody if you try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, that, so I get what you mean. And I do love a uh, comedy improv also, which is why I'm trying to myself is to bridge the gap into it. Yes. Um, which is why I'm, I've like reached out to a bunch of people because I was like, you know, maybe if I can just learn around them, eventually I'll be able because I have been trying to save up money do my own classes because I actually really do want to take the comedy sports classes offered. You have because, to. You yeah. have to. Someday you can become the association director of the entire company <laughs> worldwide. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can take my job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. Please. I just got it and I love it. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> Then I also saw on your your Instagram that it says that you're a teacher. So I was just curious yeah. if like, improv ever comes into play while you're teaching. <laughs> Literally every day. <laughs> In every aspect of the field of education, no, in every aspect of life, you are improvising if you really sit down and think about it. Like while maybe you had some guiding questions for this conversation, we didn't prepare for it. We're we're Mm -hmm. sitting here and we are talking, right? That's improvising. We don't have it scripted in front of us. So with teaching, I've been teaching, I I, I mean, I just, I want to stay young in the the (laughs) eyes of everybody here. So I've been teaching for a very long time and I've had many levels of teaching. I started in early childhood education. 
So yeah. preschool, pre-K, my bread and butter. Love it. You want to talk about improvising every single day? Get that job. It's the best in the planet. Age four is my favorite. It is the sponge age. It is oh, yes. the, I'm taking in everything around me, but at the same time, I'm formulating who I am as a human being who's a big kid now. Mm-hmm. It's a very exciting journey. So constantly improvising on the whim, switching things midway. You have to. Yeah, because the kids are very observant because you said like a sponge. So yes. I've had a lot of times where I'm like having a normal conversation with a kid and all of a sudden they'll throw something out of left field. We weren't even talking about that and you just yeah. noticed that right now. That's interesting. Absolutely. I think that I guess the trajectory of my teaching, I- I've taught first grade and even in first grade, it's about being able to think on your feet and quick adjust. It's not like every time I'm going up in front of my students, I'm on performer mode. I'd want to get paid triple for that alone. But you are able to do the quick adjust. Your lesson's going horribly wrong. Literally, there's the entire front row sleeping. You've lost them. It takes me so much less time to come up with a backup plan, whether I had the plan or not, just to get people back on board. That helps in immensely in education through improv. And now I'm teaching higher education in teaching those who wish to become future preschool and early childhood teachers. Well, since you mentioned the uh, like ability to, to fix really quickly, I actually noticed that because I've gone to quite a few comedy sports shows. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really interesting because it's you and I think you said her name was Jill. Uh-huh. I've noticed that if it starts to go off like into a weird direction, you and Jill are the we're going to pivot for them so we can save it. And I, I, I just thought that was so interesting because that's actually part of the reason why I, I wanted to talk to you guys so much because you guys are very good at the pivot and save thing. I've noticed. Aww. Yeah. I and appreciate so, hearing that. Like you don't often go into things knowing uh, what stands out to people that are watching you do it. That's pretty awesome. I like that. Your death <laughs> stare also is kind of epic alone. <sighs> Thank you. It took you know- no years of practice to have a dead face. I just... Just, I've I've been that person my entire life that unless I'm actively smiling, people are like, oh my gosh, she is such a B word. She doesn't even like anybody. She's the worst. Or like, oh my gosh, I thought you were mad at me for like the entire day. I'm like, no, I just didn't move my face. <laughs> I just have a face. Yeah. Well, I think that's why I'm so expressive now too, like especially on stage. It's because I know that in a second I can go from being like so animated done yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. one of my favorite things to do it, sorry it for the people kills. just listening yeah don't worry if you want to see the death stare go to youtube it'll be there <laughs> What is like your journey with mental health? (sighs) Heavy question. Here we go. It is. It's heavy. You know, a lot of times you don't realize that you're going through it until way after the fact. And then you realize how resilient the human brain and heart is and body, to be fair. The things that we're able to bounce back from to maybe protect us from remembering the things from our past that, that had hurt us. I think that my realization that my mental health health was something that I needed to focus on more was when my coping mechanism was bottling and walling and suddenly I had walled everything out. Yeah. My walls be thick. I'm talking CC thick. Okay. okay. Yeah. And it's from, you know, there's there's traumas that we have growing up. There's traumas that we realize occurred familially. There's traumas that we realize occurred societally that yeah. were maybe unknowingly pushed by our parents as well, just because we didn't necessarily know that it was wrong at the time. I think that it's also growing up as a dancer. There's a very specific idea of what a dancer's body looks like. I have never been thin. Yeah. I have tried. I have come close. No, never close enough for me. <laughs> I got 
close to what I thought was more societally acceptable. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the worst possible ways that you would do it. And to this day, it's that constant feel of needing to please everybody around me, look a certain way for everybody, fill the role of something so perfectly as it's prescribed to be that the pressures and the walls that mount then leave you very isolated from others, but then from who your authentic self is too, because you kind of lose track of who that is by trying to make all of these changes all of the time to yourself. I recently learned the difference of who Cameron is and who people have made me believe I'm supposed to be. Word. That is a wild differentiation, isn't it? I went away for four months last year and I came back because I was in a situation where I realized, well, this is with family, but like, I just realized they aren't even seeing me their actual like brother they're seeing like who they want to see and so my best thing is just to leave because nothing I can do is going to change this so it's kind of like it's a hard thing but like since you're talking about comparison and like oh. uh, like uh, for instance for me I wear a lot of bright things now because society because of how I'm overweight uh, made me feel which is ironic because I want to be an actor that I, I have visible. a wardrobe full of black 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 yeah. black because it's Slimming. Yeah. It looks better. You're too big to wear bright yeah. clothes. You don't want to draw attention to your mid. Oh, yes. I knew you were going to say this. Things. I yes. knew it. And uh, DBT and like uh, uh, has really helped me because I'm just like, I love bright colored things. I'm not going to not wear them because society is going to be like, oh, I'm like, that's that's your problem, not mine. Kind right. of what I learned. And that's kind of goes into the comparison factor because I have a friend who's really successful as an actor and I started to realize I was having all these like negative things when you're supposed to be happy for your friend right and I'm like well their journey is their own could make being like oh they're this far along and I'm this far along and I feel like I'm not accomplishing enough is my issue so I was just like be happy for your friend that's like it's important for that and that's something that I feel like a lot of people especially actors kind of lose sight of sometimes it's like don't compare because you only have your own career it's hard to remember that. Well I want to also throw out a different way for you because I as somebody who is so wildly insecure and wildly self-conscious it's hard to accept compliments right Mm -hmm. because there There is nobody on this entire planet who is going to tell me I'm wrong about the way that I think about myself, right? So if somebody comes up to me after a show and they're like, oh my gosh, you were amazing. Oh, you did this, you did this. In the beginning, when that started happening, I was like, oh, oh, (laughs) stop it. (laughs) And then I realized in the last two years, I'm negating that person's opinion for no other reason than I don't believe it about myself. That's awful. I just looked at somebody and said, your opinion holds zero value to me because I don't think as high of myself as you do. And it completely changed my attitude. And like anytime I hear anybody, even somebody that I just meet saying something self-deprecating or something to to tone down a a compliment or whatever, it's like, no, my opinion has value. It's my opinion that I think that you look beautiful today. Oh, that's me? Yes, you look beautiful today, Cameron. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's one of those things where then by you saying, get out of here, I look like absolute garbage. I just got out of the shower I, you know oh there's no way that you could think i look great and in my mind i'm like dude you, you look incredible like why yeah. why does my opinion not matter yeah. just because you don't find yourself to be beautiful or you yeah. don't see that talent in yourself it's crazy and so like i've been really really focusing on that as part of my journey as well shutting down the old white man supreme court justice that, that like lives in my brain talks like foghorn leghorn and he's like you'll never amount to nothing because you're a woman (laughs) you know like or or like you're not as funny as you think you should go back into your bed for a while order order in the court like there's that he's a very mean man in the back of my head who always says all of the terrible things it's so fun to shut him up now and to be like nah dude your Mm -hmm. voice doesn't affect me anymore like this person just told me i look beautiful 
beautiful today and I believe them. This voice over here is just a bunch of hypothetical things that I think that people could possibly be thinking about me, none of which were ever verbalized. And so basically, I just like I'm under the assumption that everybody's constantly thinking about me and my looks and and how I appear and what I do Mm -hmm. all of the time. Nobody thinks about us that much. (laughs) Like literally, just we do. We focus on ourselves that much that we are led to come up with all these hypotheticals. Yeah, uh, since you mentioned that you think of Foghorn Leghorn, (laughs) um, (laughs) my my voice is, I have a very good like sound memory. And so I hear the people who said those like the negative things to me. No. So like I hear it, their voice is saying it to me over and over again. So like that's also that's why hard. Yeah, because that's why I'm like, oh it must be true. It, Cause and uh and that's kind of when I was like, <sighs> oh, they're not actually thinking this. This is just my memory of them saying it because there's no way they even think about me anymore. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just it's that trauma response though, because we hold on to those things that created a big feel. And mm. like when we have a big feel like that, it we we relate it to to the the sound, the smell, the all of our senses around us at the time. It's why music is so triggering too. You know what I mean? There could have been a yeah. song playing while somebody said something awful to you. And yeah, forever I, that song is going to be in the back of your mind. Whenever you hear it, you're going to hear those words again. And it's like the association of it all. Yeah. And that's something that I've also started to like poke holes at because um, especially because we're talking about trauma responses, there's a differential way that I think about myself than the way that my trauma does. There have been times I've been really happy talking to somebody and all of a sudden I'll start crying and then they're like why are you crying and I'm like I'm not I'm really happy but I'm just like it's falling <laughs> and I'm just like no 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 I'm not upset I swear I'm really happy if I had a nickel for every time a partner or somebody looked at me and was like why are you crying we're just talking I'm like it's because my body is reacting to the stress and it has literally nothing to do with being sad like it's just <laughs> my body is so wound up that finally it's just like, oh, you said some words that are making you feel better? Psh, release. <laughs> It's so funny that you brought that up. I would be rich if I was getting paid for those experiences because it happens yeah. all of the time. Yeah, and mostly when it's not opportune because a lot of times I'll fr- I freak people out from it. They're always oh, like, get out of here. It's always fun when you get called into your boss's office yeah. to talk about something completely normal and you just start crying. Never an opportune time for that scenario for me. On this note, I guess what's something that you uh, always wish people remember when they're struggling or in that kind of place. It's hard. I think that I'm going to start with that. Me saying it's going to get better. Me saying eventually you're going to come in and feel yourself again. Eventually the the vitamin D is going to poke through and you're going to feel the sunshine again. I can say all of those things, but they all sound like platitudes, right? Yeah. They all sound like the things that we know that we're supposed to hear and say when somebody is going through a mental health struggle. I think that the best thing that you can do is acknowledge knowledge that it is hard and there's not a single person on the planet that has gone through a mental health spell or a low time or a psychotic break a anything where they're like wow i know exactly what to do now <laughs> this feels great you know what i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna stick with this for a month yeah <laughs> this, sounds, this is really fun for me i love yeah. not being able to get out of bed and brush my teeth <laughs> How great. It sucks and it's hard. But in the moment, you are so hell bent on making yourself feel bad that you can't do something that seems so easy. Instead, what if you just acknowledge, no, this is really hard right now. Yeah. And I know that there are people that have felt this level of hard before. And I know that I'm still talking to them and that they're continuing to push. And you know, you have your go to people. Yeah. I'm not going to put myself out there as a person who's always going to be available for every mental health person who needs to come and talk to me in my life. But you know I'm here and you know that I'm struggling because I'm opening, like I'm open about it. So at least just that solidarity bit. Solidarity versus solitude. I'm not saying be alone in your thoughts. It's the solidarity of knowing that you are not alone because there are other people feeling that way. Yeah, because that's also like one of the things I'm advocating for. Stop stigmatizing, like checking in on people because I feel like a lot of people have faces and like I've talked to people who are like the happiest and they never talk about it and then found out that they're like 
miserable underneath all that. And I'm just Honey, like, you're talking to a comedian and not in the stand up sense where it's very obvious I'm depressed. It's like in the improv, we do this for fun and energy. We're we're doing a, a an entertain all ages thing. And I have a laundry list of pills that I need to take some days to get out of bed. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the happy face that you see on the outside because we learned how to make all of those faces we know what the smile face correlates with happiness so all i have to do is paint a smile on and people see happy the other thing is you said uh like remember that it's hard is i feel like after you've accepted that it's hard the next thing before you can start doing anything that will help you is to learn how to proceed without judgment word Uh, and not especially judgment of self exactly a lot of times we do things in the moment that sometimes are we're like oh maybe that was an overreaction and we feel guilty and then it, we, we judge ourselves more than we should and so I've been able to get through a lot by just being like this is not who I am it's something I did this one time and the best I can do is like from this moment on be aware of this happens again not to do it to get there you have to be like I did this and I forgive myself for doing it and then you can move <sighs> past it because uh, a lot of times especially because um, I was I had this bully growing up and he was like my main bully and then like in college he reached out to me and just apologized to me and and like, did you was, accept the apology? This is okay. So I took over. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to like dark controversy or like create like online media buzz about this like long term thing. But like <laughs> now I'm, I'm invested now. I want to know how this all turned out because that's like a movie scenario for me. Well, exactly. Well, because like what I did was okay. I, I, well, one, I hated this person, but then I also, I was like, I'm not going to respond. I'm going to take a week and think about what I want to say. And then as I was thinking of over the course of this week, I felt myself get angrier and angrier. And then like my mood get more and more like darker. And then I realized one, we hadn't spoken for a while, but he was recognizing how terrible he was to me. But I'm like, I've still allowed him to bully me. And we haven't seen each other for years. And I realized the actual thing that was happening is I, I was not forgiving myself for allowing this person to bully me because I could have said more things I could have, but I judged myself for not saying anything. And when I was like, if I, if the best I can do it by forgiving this person is forgive myself, then I feel like that's probably the better thing to do. Dude, hindsight is a powerful prescription lens, my friend. It is one of those things where it will, everything looks a bit clearer on the other side. And I'm glad that that you did forgive yourself in this scenario. And I hope that he got whatever he needed to get out of it as well. Clearly he was doing some, you know, atonement for things he's done in the past. But I don't like when people apologize for the sake of saying I'm sorry and then yeah. removing all. I like yeah. to know it's coming from that place. Whereas you're getting people from, you know, your bullies are reaching out and, and, and saying that they're sorry and they recognize poor behavior. Mine are trying to, you know, hook me on MLMs and uh, essential oils. Like they, they come out of the woodwork and it literally just for themselves. Yeah. It's a very narcissistic thing and I'm not speaking ill of anyone. I'm saying I think that it's important for these people to have these moments of growth and I also don't have to forgive you. Honestly, that was just like what you're saying. There are words to, to them, but it's kind of like validation is one of a, a huge thing for me is because a lot of people think validation means saying somebody else is right when really validation is about seeing somebody and they're like them as human and right. their experience. And like you can disagree with someone 100 percent, but as long as you're with them in that moment and you're hearing them and feeling what they're conveying to you, you don't it's OK to validate them, even if you don't agree with like something that like, again, like you have a different core value than them. It's OK to disagree as long as you both respect each other as human. And that was something that I, I feel like was more of what happened because I was like, I'm not going to continue interacting with you, but I'm also okay with telling you I forgive you. Yeah. And that's kind of like a validating like their experience and that's something that I, I wish more people were okay with just validating somebody even if they're yeah. like in the heat of an argument because you don't have to agree to validate oh they have absolutely to you're allowed to say something along the lines of I appreciate you taking the time to look back and see that this was a hurtful experience for somebody else and I appreciate you reaching out to make amends for it yeah. I forgive you for that or you know what the past is behind us now 
now. Clearly, you're you're working through some things, and I'm happy for you. Have a pleasant 2023 and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> peace uh, out. Yeah. Peace out. And enjoy Blaine. I don't know, like where, <laughs> where you're from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Washington. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, you know. Yeah. We don't have sames. We're kind of like, it rains here. That's what people know about Washington. I'm from New York, which is why people are always like, you live in Minnesota, but you do not sound it. But you also don't sound like you're from anywhere else in particular because you've kind of like mushed your accents together. Yeah, my uh, friend Anthony uh, is like a hardcore New Yorker. And then again, I've been to improv shows and sometimes I can't tell the difference between you as a person and you doing a character. So I yeah. was like, wow, she's really good at a New Yorker. <laughs> I didn't well, realize that that was just you. <laughs> no, that is channeling literally my father. <laughs> like, okay. It is, it is me putting on just like the the Bobby D, Robert De Niro, for all of you who don't speak New York, be calling Bobby D. Because you know we're on a first name basis with all people who have ever played mob characters in movies. But no, that's like my go-to for something that I know is going to have an impact on a Midwest crowd. Throw out a good New York <laughs> accent to them and they're like what i love accent it's my favorite i love doing anything accent wise as long as i hear it first i can do it i'm like uh, an aper are you just somebody because this is me i can't talk to some people on the phone because i'm a mimicker and i won't realize until the person says are you making fun of me and i'm like was i copying no i'm not voice? i mean <laughs> <laughs> yes no <laughs> <laughs> yeah because like and that's because as an actor i'm fascinated with accents also so then my brain just starts wanting to try them and then i'm like oh no this could be really rude to people if they don't know me. Remember how I said that comedy sports was uh, yeah. all over the United States and uh, Manchester? <laughs> Try going to Manchester to visit and then playing comedy sports in Manchester, okay? We're playing and, you know, I love them. I love them so much. They're my family. They're my, they're my, they're my British family. And yeah. we have this game called Dick Van Dyke. We haven't played it in forever, so I don't even know if you know this. I don't think so. So basically, it is a game where two teams send a player in each and they're going up against each other doing scenes in random accents. It's called Dick Van Dyke because he was so notoriously bad at his Cockney accent in Mary Poppins. Oh, I'm a chimney sweet. Oh, Mary. Oh, wah, wah, wah. Like yeah. that was Dick Van Dyke's Cockney accent, right? Yeah. And it's just so notoriously bad that they created this game called Dick Van Dyke where yeah. uh, the suggestions that we're getting throughout it will then change the accent. So you can do regional United States. You can do appropriate accents for the people that are on uh, the the fields to be doing. Yeah. So I'm in Manchester. They want to play Dick Van Dyke. I'm like... <sighs> first one they throw out they're like Lancastershire and I'm like the British I don't know <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> so then I was just like listening I, I would like make it a point to have the other person always initiate the scene first so I can hear what Lancastershire sounds like as opposed to like Brook Waterford <laughs> and yeah. so they keep like saying all these regional places and I'm like oh my gosh I'm just like doing my best hit to keep it up I kid you not the next one that they said New York okay it was done it was done deal but what i'm saying like the reason i even brought this up was as an actor being around all of just like an entire performance group of people with gorgeous accents that i do not have i'd be going home and i'm like oh good shout good shout yeah you know like picking up all these phrases from from the uk because i just think it's so cool and i yeah. i it was really hard to not mimic like really yeah. hard i'm an aper by heart and i cannot help it and it's because I find it so fascinating that like I want to be able to do it as like an homage to you. I feel like the accents say, can save things. Do you they... know that an actual French woman at the end of a comedy sports show, she came up to me and she said, your French accent is so good. Are you from France? And I said, no, but you just made me the happiest woman <laughs> on the face of the planet. Like not an exaggeration. That was one of the top comedy sports moments of my life was a French woman coming 
coming up to me and saying that my French accent was very good. Top notch. Yeah. I wanted to explain why I asked to interview to begin with, uh-huh. uh, because uh, a lot of it is because I do love comedy sports and I go a lot. But um, also <laughs> the first comedy sports I ever went to was on my birthday. And this was like um, right after like they just started opening things again. Yeah. And I kind of came to Minnesota. Like basically I was escaping my family in Washington when they were like, we're going to shut the border. And then for like two years, I had no outside things except for my friends here. And then like, I was really upset because I wasn't able to practice acting at all, really. And then I just remember going and like seeing all these people do comedy and like do uh, like improv. So well, one very well, but I just reminded me that even though when you want to be an actor, it's a, like some people, like I've been told by my teachers that if you can do anything else, you probably should because it's a right. very hard thing to get into. And so I've uh, sacrificed a lot. And so sometimes I question whether or not it's worth it. And then like that first show reminded me why I, I am still wanting to be an actor. And it had a lot to do with like you and then for, you've done it other times but the, the first one I never met anybody and you just really zeroed in on me yeah, and something about that meant so much to me then because I was questioning a lot about my my own self-worth and my dreams and it really helped reconfirm that for me so I wanted Dude, to say I you. wish this was not dreaming so I can give you a big old hug that was so kind thank you for saying that that means everything because I'm I'm not an actor I didn't yeah. go into the thinking that this was going to help me to land roles and there was always a little tiny kid weird kid in me who loved making believe and singing and I I know I can do those things well but then I went to school for teaching and I have four degrees like like there, there are all of these things that I have that are not at all involved in acting. Even yeah. when I just said as an actor, like I had to like swallow a little throw up because I was like, <laughs> you're not an actor. <laughs> like that. I'm, I don't consider myself. I consider myself a lucky human who has found an outlet to amplify all of the things I was always so ashamed and afraid to show because it was either too weird or according to what society and people told me was not going to be good enough. And so this it has become my big old you said I couldn't do it you were wrong remember when I whispered to you and I said I would be better as the lead in this play than this person ha 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 I just did an entire musical improvise pow <laughs> mindfulness is kind of all about being present and in the moment and in order to be present you have to be able to listen and then react very to what's happening now because our brain wants to take us either into the past and I know as an actor sometimes I'm like well this past performance I did it so well yep. but then if you think about that it distracts you and same thing with the future you're like I have these dreams or this is the next line and then it becomes not real because you're not actually living truthfully in the moment so I was curious if there's any that you know of that are also kind of utilized a lot with improv well like you you kind of hit the nail on the head because the whole idea of improv this is so like what TED talk like you could watch any TED talk on improv you can read any book on improv improv and the two words you're going to see are yes and it is just kind of the known two words to go with improv however what if you applied them to your life mm-hmm. what if when you're faced with something difficult let's say you're punched in the face with greed because something mm-hmm. terrible happened i can say no and it's going to happen anyway or i can say yes i accept this offer because i realize this is a thing that i'm supposed to be feeling right now because something terrible happened or whatever reason i'm in grief and Now I'm going to figure out what I can do with it instead of what it's going to prevent me from doing. It's not a yes, but it's not a no, but it's a yes. And it's Mm -hmm. I'm I'm faced with this terrible thing and I can choose to accept it and continue on because this is what life is throwing me right now or, or what, (laughs) you know what I mean? So I think that that's one of the things being mindful and versatile in the offerings that life give you. How's that? That's like that. That sounded like really good. It sounded very yes, like, and the yeah. mental health improv approach by Aaron Kennedy. <laughs> Watch out for my memoir coming in 
late listen. 2024. I listened to that TED talk. And, you know, there's some that I questioned, but like, I wish somebody would just break down acting at through all this, which is kind of what I'm doing. But I, there's so much that goes hand in hand with like uh, compassion and empathy. Yeah. So many things you have to have like as an actor that like if, if more people utilize those skills, the world would be better. Well, here's the other thing that I think about too. And so when I was teaching improv, my favorite ones to teach were 101. All of the people who ever were like, I think I could maybe do this or my acting coach says I needed to or I just turned 60. Like, <laughs> you know, like that person. Yeah. <laughs> and so true grab bag of all of these personalities. And it's my favorite one for brain function. Okay. okay. So stay on board with me right now because I am okay. by no means a scientist. I do not have a PhD of any kind. I am a master's level. However, <laughs> none of it has to do with science. Obviously, improv scientifically speaking, I love blowing up people's brain synapse pathways. That is my main goal of level one, because as we grow into adulthood, we lose the fun, imaginative, creative, willing to take risks person because we're learning how to interact in a world that has very specific rules associated with it and associated with each of the things that we're doing in life. So I'm 60, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm coming in and I'm trying improv. I love whacking down all of those pathways, but I'm going to tell you what, 60, I'm so excited to do improv. Nine times out of 10, way more willing to be silly than the actor who was told he needs to take improv classes because the actor that's being told that he needs to take improv classes is using this as a very clear and defined step in a process of things that he needs to do to become a better actor instead of realizing I'm going to jump into his actor brain and when his brain tells him he needs to take a specific exit on the highway I'm going to rainbow road him off of <laughs> off of you know the highway that he's on I'm going to throw him into like Donkey Kong country and have him shot out of a barrel to get to his actual location. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah. that's my favorite thing. And then in 201, when we're developing characters and how we can become these other people, you said it, and it's something that I pride myself in. I don't, I like the lines to be blurred between Aaron, the character, and who Aaron is as a human being when I'm performing. I yeah. like that because there's an authenticity to it that like engages people more in what that character is doing naturally yeah. because it's like this character's personality is taking me on a journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the ways that we can do that is by thinking about emotions, right? When I tell somebody to be sad, okay, what am I sad about? There's actually levels, right? Mm -hmm. I can say, I want you at a level one sad. And maybe that means that you just thought about the fact that there's a cloud up in the sky and you're like, oh man, I really want wanted it to be a clear day mm -hmm. yeah. and like that's that's your level one sad and then maybe we, we amp it up to a five and it's like oh this is like when I found out that you know my dog was not going to be okay after he came back from the vet now I'm going to use that level of sad now I'm turning it to an 11 what happens when we're past a 10 what happens when we are grieving so hard that we throw ourselves over the casket and we yeah. are just screaming angry looking that's sad that's yeah. a level of sad too. So really like improv has taught me to break down all of the levels of four basic feelings that we had. This is a Jill Bernard original, mad, sad, glad, a frat. <laughs> Oh, Fred. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, you got to have it rhyme. But if you think <laughs> about it, all of the emotions in the world, everything that you feel are based on those four pillars. Afraid, obviously, being the last one. Yeah. But fear. And because there are so many levels that we can explore when we're trying to create these characters, when we're trying to create these vibes, we're actually connecting with times that we have felt multiple levels of multiple emotions and yeah. the way in which our brains and our bodies and our hearts reacted to those things. And I think in exploring that, it helped me to understand the levels at which I'm feeling depressed, the levels at which I'm feeling anxious, the levels of which my agoraphobia is keeping me inside. Does it mean that I, I'm only within my apartment complex? Does it mean that I go to the store by myself and then I come back? Or does it mean that I go out and I can do a show and I just am not going to hang out with people afterward? What level am I at today? And realizing that wherever I am at, it's okay. I've recognized that I am there. I 
see the emotion and the intensity at which I am feeling it. And now I know where to go for the rest of the day, or at least for the next five minutes, depending on yeah. how quickly my mood changes. Limitations is something that's kind of what you're talking about. It's mm-hmm. kind of like you allow yourself to experience emotion, but your emotion left unchecked will like, will just revel in it. They'll be like, we're going to do this for all day. Unless you're well, like, and then, yeah. yeah, and sadness becomes anger then. And so now I think I'm angry because somebody died when in reality, I'm just feeling the most intense level of sad that yeah. I have really ever felt. I might be a little bit angry, but it's yeah. also sadness that I'm feeling. You find your ways to adapt in the world to make it work for you and all of your neurodivergencies and all of your idiosyncrasies and all of the things that everybody told you was weird. We're figuring it out now, y'all. We're yeah. figuring out how to communicate and be in society and come across totally normal. And you all are going to be so surprised when you find out how messed up we are. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is part of why we do what we do and why we gravitate to the things that we do. Your mental health took you on a respite of, I'm figuring out how to act. I'm figuring out how to feel these emotions that I never really felt on my own before or allowed myself to feel on my own. Now, oh my gosh, I know how to feel emotions and this is a lot and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to go to comedy sports and I'm going to watch a match and I'm going to laugh for probably an hour longer than is scheduled. Hey, (laughs) brought that around again. Call back. Exactly. You felt fa- like you found the ways in which you can be you in a world that was not necessarily set up for people with divergency in their thinking yeah. in general, in their brain waves, in their emotions, in the way in which they present themselves in their physical nature. The world was not created for everybody in the same way. And yeah. so it's so important for, for people to find the best way that they can represent themselves and get Get the things that they need out of society instead of what they think society needs them to get. Yeah. And I love what you're describing because basically what we're talking about is basically setting healthy boundaries with people. Because like, <laughs> like I've done that with people where I'm like, I know that other people looking in on me doing this to you are going to be like, wow, that guy is a jerk. But like you and I know that this is our thing. So yes. it means I love you. Yes. But I need this from you. So like I've had that conversation because it's like a boundary that we need to be good with us. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I love how open for as behind as we are still in 2023. I will not even get into that. We really have come a long way in mental health awareness, in talking and creating platforms for people to realize that they are not alone. And with so many celebrities and public figures coming forward, it's like, it makes all of us feel like, oh snap, that person's billionaire and they still are depressed. That person just made a 22 million dollar movie and they're on Xanax because they're supposed to be. It's something that is so great that at least because communication is what it is while we are oversaturated right now yeah. with ways to get your voice out there and there's a lot of people using it for the wrong thing but there are so many people now using it for things that if I was in middle school I would have had a completely different experience in middle school because I would have yeah. seen that there were other weird misfits who like kind of liked girls sometimes but also like boys and like what what is what does this mean when I want to just like act like a cat today but then like I know I'm a human in seventh grade like so I probably shouldn't act like a cat today you know like yeah the playground <sighs> like I, I have friends like that who are just like we're gonna be on the playground today no matter what it gives me hope but it also yeah. still scares me for the future just because of how oversaturated everything is now too and how out there everything is yeah and what you said is actually why I'm even doing this uh, podcast radio show to begin with is like I I went into a partial hospitalization program and I've discovered all these things. And then I was like, how have none of these things been taught to us, especially because most of them are things I feel like children should know? Because like, if I knew that like, m- like my thoughts or the thoughts of others are not me as a child, it would have helped me so much, like block them out. Because we're told not to listen to each other, but we're not told how to like challenge our thoughts that well. Mm-hmm. And like, I was in a really bad place. I just thought because of like, they tell you to like turn to friends and family and it wasn't really an option for me and that's why I went the hospitalization program and then I was like if I had this or if somebody else finds this who's struggling it would make doing it worth so much more to me because then I've given it to somebody who like might need it like and that's something that 
matters to me is because people who are supposed to make you feel worthy of life and being a human sometimes forget to or don't have it in them to even try. But or that's don't their... have the words that translate their love in the way that you are hearing it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I get that completely. Sorry. I, I really appreciate no, I really I really appreciate your your open uh and, and honest candor because it, if we are being real, I'm coming out of right now probably the lowest of lows I have been in ever ever mm. in my life. Would you know that? Probably not. Like not from performance wise, but I I have I'm very observant, but I have noticed like because I observe very well uh, like a little change in how you react after shows, but just because mm. I you're, you usually went from being very bubbly to very like I'm here going and then leaving. So yes. I did notice that, but like but And that um, that's part of the agoraphobia and everything that goes with it, right? It's yeah. like I know that I have this mission to help other people feel happy and laugh. So for the next two hours, that's my 110% that I am doing. And then it's like the lights go down. I come back to, to reality after blacking out for the last two hours. And I'm like, oh, I'm sleepy. I want to go home. Num, num, num. And, and then... <laughs> And that's it. Because yeah. it's 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 like something else takes over me because I know how important this thing is, A, for other people, but B, for me as well, to, yeah. to get to do this, this weird thing. So as somebody who in the last couple of weeks has been my sleeping is so much easier than work. Yeah. Then brushing my teeth, then getting up and brushing my hair, doing anything to make me feel like a human. Yeah. And you took it the step further to say, I need somebody outside of myself to help. And I need it to be a situation where I am there and they are helping me. Yeah. And that has been something that has been the ultimate hurdle for me is saying when enough is enough and I need the help because mm -hmm. I will always be that firstborn type A who is. I've got this. I have to show everybody that I have this. I have to show that I can handle it. I'm the oldest, so I have to set the example. My sisters are watching me, so what are they seeing me doing? I am the person. Yeah. And so it, when you are the person, you put yourself elsewhere because it's all about doing things in a way to make other people happy. I will say learning <laughs> that to ask for help can be hard, but like a lot of people find it hard to ask for help. And then like I've noticed with people when I have actually like gone in and gotten help and then started talking to them about the help I received. Because in our head, I, when I first, I did never went and got help because I was like, I don't want to be viewed as somebody who isn't capable of handling his own life. And I, especially because there's like a, a bad narrative you can get in your head that if somebody knows you go to therapy, they'll think you're crazy. Or God yeah. forbid they find out that you were institutionalized. I understand yeah. the stigma. I mean, it's the same reason why parents are so apprehensive about getting their children uh, specific help through special education programs because all they see is the red flag of special ed. And that yeah. red flag is going to just follow them everywhere. So the second we say we're going to therapy, red flag, this is somebody who has mental health health issues. Done. This is actually why I try to lead with that. I don't like putting my emotions on somebody else, but I do like being upfront with where I'm at Word. because I, I feel like when I meet new people and when I'm in with my friends, if they know where I'm coming from, mm -hmm. I feel more like able to be like there for you as a friend if I'm honest than, in, than if I'm pretending to be something that, that I'm not. Word! If I don't feel 100%, how can you expect me to give 100%? That's what I was exactly. trying to say. Yeah. And what I have recently with my my partner, he is a teacher and it's like ingrained in teachers also that we are never allowed to take time off because if we take time off, then there has to be a sub, but we know that there's a shortage on subs. So if you're taking time off, you're knowingly leaving everybody in lurk and then uh, the, the children are going to fall behind and then all of your team is going to hate you and then the principal is going to hate you and then the PTA is going to hate you. Then everybody's going to hate you. That's how it feels yeah. where then we would be like, I'll wear a mask today and I guess I'm sick at work because writing all these lesson plans, writing everything out for a sub is so much more work. I recently told my partner, I was like, you need to take care of yourself. Yeah. You need to use the days that you have 
earn for your personal time off or your sick days or whatever. And you need to use that because you have 27 children who are expecting you to help guide them at 100% so that they can continue growing to become their 100%. Yeah. And you're showing up, your little battery life on your first person shooter video game up in the corner right here is like, it's at like, it's blinking. It is blinking yeah. and there are no first aid packs anywhere. Sorry, dude. You're not going to pick them up. You're not going to get it. You, there's no, there's no little fruit like Pac-Man for you to eat right now. Stay home. Yeah. And this is the first year that he's ever used all of his PTO. Yeah. And I am so proud of him because it's hard to recognize, like you said, when we need to actually take the time for us that we should never feel bad taking to begin with. I am who I am and I went for my dreams because <laughs> of my teacher. Like my teacher is actually the person that told me, well, she was like, I believe in you and you can go to this other school, but I think you could go to this other school in New York yeah. if you believe in yourself. But I'm not going to tell you which one, but I'm just telling you how I feel because of that. that's actually what pushed me. And so I, I did a film with her because I went back for a summer and we shot something because she's also an actress. I just was like, she was telling me that she was thinking about quitting teaching because she doesn't like her own mental uh, like health has been suffering. And I'm just like, this woman does so much for people. When I went through, it was like all the kids went to her and then like when I was bullied, she's like, well, because I was bullied at home and at school. So she let me stay over like really late at school with her. Yeah. And so I just feel like it's important that we you, you should allow teachers to take care of themselves because they do a lot for kids. Oh, that is a whole other podcast and a half, my friend. <laughs> if I can get onto a soapbox, I would be on the horn with you for another two ding dang hours. Can you sum up comedy sports for anybody who has never like experienced it before so comedy sport it is short form improv and it is played like a sport sport z, it's comedy sport z, with a z at the end okay yeah. it is two teams of players and a referee the referee kind of guides the loyal fan through the games calls foul because you know it's a sport so we have to have fouls of course uh, one of them being something called the groaner foul which means if anything is super punny or like make the audience literally groan person who said whatever punny thing needs to apologize. It's just it's grabbing audience suggestions, it's creating a competition experience. I mean, that's basically the gist of it. You're competing for points and laughs. It is always comedy for everyone. No matter which comedy sports you go to in whatever state you wish to, it's always going to be comedy that stays above the belt. You know, yeah. we, we try to make sure that there's no swearing. We try to make sure that there's not really like crude innuendos of any kind. We get close to a line, but we know where to stop before we cross that line so that we can pander to the adult in the room yeah. while there may be children there as well. You know, kind of fun ways to do things like that. Where can they find you? When's like the next yeah. show? CSZTwinCities.com. That is the website for Comedy Sports Twin Cities, which of course is in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. However, if you would like to see what other cities there are, CSZWorldwide.com is the other uh, website where you'll see all of the other cities that we perform in. Kind of a bigger picture of what the CSZ Worldwide community is and why it should be recognized as big as Second City or as IO as one of the, you know, founding institutions of improv, especially for short form. In the Twin Cities, though, we are between three or four theaters throughout the metro area. We have uh, one in Northeast Minneapolis called Strike Theater. They're wonderful and they they support us and they let us perform there. We have uh, the Elysian Theater in, here in Crystal, a char house in Lakeville. Uh, it, and we're doing a show there um, in May. And then in South Minneapolis at the Center for Performing Arts, we are also doing a show. But otherwise, uh, go on to CSZTwinCities.com and you'll see where all of our next shows are going to be, where all of our next matches are going to be around the, the Twin Cities and surrounding area. And if you ever wanted us to come and do, you know, uh, a, a corporate training event uh, where we 
teach you how to use improv and applied business situations. If you wanted to bring us into your, your college theater program, your college for an orientation day, your birthday party, a book burning. I don't know. We'll come anywhere if you anywhere. pay us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and this is not a joke. When people have said this during, during matches before, they're like, oh, we'll go anywhere if you pay us. We did a show in somebody's basement. That's true. Oh, okay. That is true. We have done a full comedy sports match in somebody's basement. I was not there. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> because... You know, put generalized anxiety disorder in a random person's basement and it's not going to be okay. Yeah, I could I could see that. <laughs> a little worrisome. <laughs> and my last question was just whether or not you had anything else you wanted to say. I want to say interview. thank you for doing what you do and raising awareness for, you know, mental health on whatever platform you have. And I think that it's, it's wonderful that you're doing it with the mindset of look at all these things that I have learned along my journey that other people may have not have had access to. And I'd love to be able to bring access to it. But then also you're kind of broadening the net of the ways in which we cope and the the things that we can do in the community that will bring a smile to our face and, and bring some laughter on those days where it seems near impossible to find it ourselves. Come and see us. We'll help you. We'll, I mean, we'll make I, you laugh. I, it's a good idea. It's helped me. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, it really means that means a lot just to hear that, you know, we are we are providing that dopamine. Well, OK, first, thank you. You just said you never accept compliments. So I'm like, I, I almost didn't. So thank you. I really appreciate everything that you said. It, it meant a lot to me. Good, dude. But thank you for saying thank you, because my opinions are valid and they matter. They do. As does everyone's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Especially uh, Thomas and JJ right here. They just came in last night. <laughs> <laughs> 